sponsored by the Cornell Center for Integrated Developmental Science. And I have the pleasure um, today of introducing our speaker, uh, Dr. <laughs> Jean Holt Lundsted. Um, professor Holt Lundsted is uh, a professor of psychology and neuroscience at Brigham Young University, um, where she also directs the social neuroscience lab. Um, her research is focused on the long-term health effects of social connection, and her work uh, has been uh, seminal in the uh, recognition of social isolation and loneliness as risk factors for early mortality. Uh, in addition to her scholarly uh, uh, research, she's the founding uh, scientific chair for the U.S. Coalition to End Social Isolation and Loneliness uh, and, the, uh, and the Foundation for Social Connection. <clears throat> She's worked with um, government organizations to address issues to do with loneliness and social isolation, uh, providing expert testimony before the US Congress and recommendations to the US uh, uh, Surgeon General, as well as um, serving on uh, a number of uh, scientific advisory committees, including the US, uh, uh, excuse me, the UK Cross Departmental Loneliness Team and the National Academy of Sciences Engineering and Medicine Consensus Committee. And so I'm really um, looking forward to her talk today. Uh, before I, I turn it over to um, Dr. Holt Lundstedt, I just want to remind those in attendance to please um, post your questions in the Zoom chat um, and, and feel free to post those questions as the talk is ongoing so we can get started um, with those questions straight away uh, or to try to uh, put them in the chat as quickly as possible after the talk. Um, so with that, uh, Julianne, if, if you're ready, please uh, please take it away. Thank you so much. Um, it's so great to to join you all. I'll, although it, um, you know virtually, I'll, always feels a little bit disconnected in a way. Um, but I hope that this is um, just a, a beginning of many conversations that we can continue to have. Because um, I always. Um, uh, look forward to additional kinds of collaborations and and I hope that um, my remarks today can can spark some interest and um, uh, an alignment with with what you all are working on. Um, so I'm going to be talking about social connection as a major public health challenge and and I understand that um, uh, many of you may have differing um, uh, perhaps um, levels of, of connection to this in terms of your own work. And so I hope that I, I'm able to um, uh, give a, a bit of foundation for those of you who may be um, less familiar with this and, and, and provide a little bit more detail for those who, who want that and, and can um, strike a nice balance there. Um, I do want to acknowledge, uh, of course, some of my collaborators for the work that I'm going to be talking about today, as well as um, um, uh, my work with the U.S. Foundation for Social um, Connection um, and the, the scientific um, council members. Um, I will also add um, that um, uh, in addition to the National Academy of Science um, uh, consensus committee report that I'll be discussing or touch on briefly um, today. I'm actually um, a member of another new committee that's relevant to this work um, on uh, social media, youth and health um, that uh, is not out yet, but um, if you're interested, there are recordings of some of the information. Um, so you can always access that online if, if you're interested. Um, I, I want to start by um, acknowledging that we're nearing the three-year mark since the World Health Organization declared a global pandemic. And of course, there are plans to end the um, COVID health emergency um, in a couple months. Um, but the, the pandemic highlighted the importance of social connection and concerns about isolation and loneliness. Um, so during this time, this led to a sense of urgency um, that, that emerged to both understand the public health consequences as well as uh, strategies to mitigate risk. Um, so, of course, my schedule got very busy. Um, but, um, you know, 
it's interesting because, of course, um, early on, there was a lot of attention paid um, primarily to older adults, but of course, each of us had to significantly um, alter how we engage socially with others during this time. Um, so just for an example, um, or examples, um, children's education changed, um, uh, education in general changed for that matter. Uh, remote work became the norm, which of course was particularly hard on um, parents. Um, teens and college students whose social lives should be expanding um, were instead profoundly disrupted. Um, and of course, just the way in which we engaged with our environment, um, in, including things like um, social distancing um, policies were, were implemented. So um, in a way, social isolation was um, no longer something that was experienced by just a few, but we all, to some extent, um, experienced this and on a global scale. Um, but of course, our need for social connection and the dangers associated with isolation are not new. Um, this is just some um, relatively um, new data. Um, in fact, it might still be online first. Um, that comes from the American Time Use Survey, um, which uh, shows um, over the past two decades, so starting in 2003, we see significant increases in time spent in isolation and significant decreases in time spent with family, um, both inside and outside the home, uh, time spent with friends, and, times, uh, and time spent with others, um, including um, companionship. And so, as you can see, these trends began well before the pandemic. So this issue is not new. Uh, there were also several surveys that find um, that found increases in loneliness um, and distress uh, during the pandemic. And of course, this is not surprising um, because distress due to limiting social contact um, is a normal response. Um, humans are social beings and we aren't meant to be alone. So um, we can see across a number of species that being socially connected to a group serves important functions, whether it's direction to safety, evading predators, uh, pooling of resources, protection from the elements, uh, reciprocal altruism, um, or obtaining food, being part of a group is essential to survival. Uh, in fact, um, humans are perhaps one of the most vulnerable species um, at birth. And so if left alone, a human infant would, would die. Um, and throughout human history, we have needed to rely on others for our survival. So lacking proximity to others, um, particularly trusted others, um, is in essence a very vulnerable position to be in. Um, this has led some neuroscientists to argue that our brains have adapted to um, or adapted to expect proximity to others, um, such that some even have argued that social is the neuro default. Uh, when others are absent, um, our, our brains um, may need to be more active. So not only does it take more effort to meet the demands of life on our own, um, but we also must be more vigilant to threats in our environment. So this has led some uh, to argue that loneliness can be thought of as a biological motive similar to hunger and thirst. So the late John Cassiopo um, made, made this argument as well, um, suggesting that um, much like hunger um, uh, motivates us to seek out food and thirst motivates us to seek out water, that loneliness is a biological motive that um, motivates us to reconnect socially. And so um, just as food and water are essential to survival, um, the connecting socially is, is essential uh, to survival as well. 
So of course, um, this uh, leads to then how, how we define the issue and to um, uh, e expand on that biological motive um, analogy, we can also think about how um, in those cases, um, it's the, if those biological needs are not met, um, that that can lead to um, poor kinds of outcomes. Um, but also just like um, food and water are essential to survival, um, that not all food is equally nutritious and that food can also um, uh, spoil and can um, and water can be um, contaminated. Um, and so we also need to consider um, the quality. So as we think about defining um, uh, this issue, um, my colleagues and I have um, used the term social connection as an umbrella term to encompass the many different approaches that have accumulated across several scientific um, disciplines and the wide range of, of measurement um, approaches um, within this and then um, and the types of social connections that influence um, risk for mortality. And so these generally fall under three broad categories. Um, so social connection would encompass the structural, functional, and quality aspects um, of, of our relationships and interactions with others. So um, structural uh, really gets at the existence of, of um, relationships and roles in our life. Um, the functional aspect includes the functions um, that are uh, provided or perceived to be available. And then finally, um, the quality, the, the positive and negative aspects of relationships, recognizing that not all of our relationships are entirely positive and that relationships can also um, be sources of, of strain and conflict and negativity. Um, and so this umbrella term social connection encompasses these um, uh, these three broad categories of, of conceptualizations such that um, uh, higher levels of social connection or higher um, levels on any one of these um, categories or indicators within these categories um, would be associated with uh, lower risk, whereas low levels on these would be associated with higher risk. It also may be helpful to distinguish between um, a few distinct and related terms um, because we often hear um, uh, the terms social isolation and loneliness used and used um, quite often inter um, interchangeably. So social isolation is thought to be um, more objective, um, uh, objectively being alone or having few relationships or infrequent social contact, whereas loneliness is a subjective um, feeling um, or, or distressing feeling um, that is um, often uh, stemming from the discrepancy between one's desired level of connection and one's actual level of connection. Um, so, of course, you can be isolated and not lonely and lonely and not isolated, um, but they can often uh, co-occur. Um, What's important to recognize is that um, in both cases, isolation and loneliness represent um, uh, deficits or, or low levels of social connection, um, but they um, uh, may not necessarily encompass the full spectrum of low social connection. Um, and importantly, all have been linked to both health and well-being. So as I mentioned earlier, I served on a National Academy of Science consensus committee that examined the, the medical and healthcare relevance of social isolation and loneliness um, among older adults. And after review of the body of evidence, uh, the committee found substantial evidence that social isolation and loneliness are associated with greater incidence of major psychological, cognitive, and physical morbidities and lower perceived well-being or quality of, of life. Um, some of the most compelling evidence comes from the association of social isolation 
with um, significantly increased risk for premature mortality from all causes. Um, so this led the committee to conclude that social isolation is a major public health concern. I do want to note that this report was published February 27th, 2020. Um, so literally two weeks before the WHO declared um, a, a, a global pandemic. So we, we already had substantial evidence of negative health effects of, of isolation um, even before the pandemic. Um, I do want to note that while this report was focused on older adults, um, in many cases, we drew on evidence that, that um, cuts across ages. So this conclusion um, the, that we um, came to um, also comes from decades of epidemiological research. And so in my own research, I have uh, sought to determine the overall magnitude of the effect of various forms of, of being socially connected or disconnected um, by examining the available epidemiological data worldwide. And so um, after uh, thoroughly reviewing relevant databases, um, my colleagues and I conducted a meta-analysis um, um, and uh, we are the this the one looking at um, uh, social disconnection included 70 prospective studies. Um, so this um, included data from over 3.4 million participants followed for an average of seven years. And after accounting for multiple covariates, our analyses revealed that loneliness is associated with an increased risk of earlier death by 26%, social isolation by 29%, and living alone by 32%. Um, just to um, clarify, there was um, no significant differences between them, um, so they were all significant predictors of, of premature mortality. Um, now, conversely, in an earlier meta-analysis of 148 uh, prospective studies um, examining the protective effect of being socially connected, we found that social connection increases odds of survival by 50%. Um, again, um, importantly, that these studies accounted for age, initial health status, and a variety of other factors, establishing it as an independent predictor of mortality risk. Um, since this time, there have been multiple meta-analyses that have replicated these findings. Uh, one recent uh, review identified 276 studies. Um, uh, and of course, there have been several more that have been published since this review was done. Um, so there are are, are um, many more, but um, what this suggests is converging evidence that, that replicates um, these findings, giving us greater confidence in them. Um, I share with you um, just some of the data. I don't expect you to um, pay attention to all of these numbers, um, but just um, to note the different types of measurement approaches um, that um, have been utilized in this and in um, in all but one case, uh, they were um, significantly Im impacted uh, mortality. And the only one that didn't reach significance, um, so that, as you can see, the confidence interval included one, um, was received support. And although the odds ratio wasn't um, particularly tiny, um, what we can see is that the confidence interval was large, um, suggesting that there may be variability in terms of, of this um, particular outcome, which I think has a lot of implications for, um, for interventions, um, suggesting that some may be helpful and some may not be. Um, so I think that that's um, uh, an important note. But um, the remainder were all um, significant. And with the strongest effect being um, among complex measures of social integration, which interestingly cover more aspects of that, um, the components of social connection across the structural function and quality. 
So um, uh, one of the questions that often comes up is just just how serious is this and, and um, how do we contextualize um, the magnitude of the effect? And given um, lack of, of um, public recognition of this, my colleagues and I um, decided to benchmark these findings relative to other factors associated with mortality risk. And so we identified other meta-analyses that um, had uh, mortality as an outcome um, uh, factors, um, including lifestyle and environmental factors. Um, and as you can see, um, they vary in the in the degree to which they um, uh, predict uh, mortality. And so then when we compare that against um, various indicators of social connection um, as represented in the orange bar, what we can see is that in many cases, they're very comparable. Um, and in some cases, even exceed the um, risk associated with some of these other factors, um, factors, of course, that we take quite seriously. I do want to note that um, uh, that these were um, uh, in, in some cases, the variables were inversed um, because some are protective while others are associated with risk. So that each bar uh, represents the strength of the effect on, on survival. Um, and so um, I certainly don't want to um, in any way take away from the importance of these other factors, but um, in essence, um, make the case that uh, perhaps we should be um, uh, taking um, our, our social connection um, uh, connections uh, just as, as seriously for health um, as these factors that we prioritize and give a lot of attention and resources to in public health. I do want to make one other note. Um, and that is, um, as we can see among these indicators, um, one of the, the, um, the least robust of these was actually loneliness. Um, and not to diminish from loneliness, because of course it was still comparable to physical um, inactivity, obesity, and, and air pollution. Um, but also to note that given that these were inversed, um, that loneliness is not the equivalent of, of lacking social connection. So remember, it's just one indicator of low social connection um, because if inversing it, um, if it really was um, a catch-all for just lacking social connection, they would be equivalent. Um, and as you can see, some of these others are um, a bit stronger than that. So we just need to be careful about how, um, the, the terms that we use in thinking about how this impacts health. So just to briefly summarize, um, the cumulative evidence suggests that um, the magnitude of the effect of being socially disconnected, including isolation and loneliness, is robust compared to um, uh, other kinds of risk factors. Um, these findings were consistent across um, cause of death, although the majority of the studies were disease-related causes of death, um, and in fact, most excluded suicide as a cause of death. So these are not being driven by suicide. Um, we also have evidence that both objective and subjective indicators um, predict risk for premature mortality. Um, so both are important in terms of understanding someone's risk. Um, uh, um, and then uh, finally, um, the data uh, controlled for a variety of potential confounders and, and other um, uh, known uh, factors pointing to independent risk and uh, ruling out reverse causality. Um, so what are the, the effects that go beyond premature mortality? And I'll, I'll go through these fairly quickly, but um, there is data that's consistent um, with the mortality um, that suggests that um, lacking social connection influences a variety of health outcomes, including physical health, um, um, increased risk for heart attack and stroke. In fact, I'll note that the American Heart Association just this year published a scientific statement on that. Um, uh, there's also um, uh, evidence in terms of risk for uh, mental and behavioral health, including increased risk for depression and anxiety, suicidality and addiction. Um, there's also evidence on cognitive health, um, including mild cognitive impairment, dementia, and Alzheimer's disease. 
And there is um, uh, some evidence pointing to the influence on even economic health or economic outcomes. Um, just one example, uh, AARP found that social isolation among older adults is associated with $6.7 billion in annual Medicare spending. Um, the economic burden um, may be much larger, um, given, of course, that that um, analysis was simply um, focused on older adults um, and Medicare recipients. Um, uh, and we do have some evidence suggesting, um, for example, um, this has been linked to greater workplace absenteeism, lower productivity, and lower quality of work, um, suggesting uh, a, perhaps a larger economic um, impact. Um, so do we have evidence, though, of um, plausible mechanisms? You know, how is it that we get from A to B? You know, how is it that we get from being socially connected um, to uh, or, or lacking social connection and, and having better or worse health? Uh, so there's a growing body of evidence that documents the pathways by which these associations occur. Uh, that give us important clues on, on how it is that our relationships can ultimately um, influence better or worse health and ultimately survival. Um, so, for example, uh, the, the distressing feelings of, of being isolated and lonely may um, heighten uh, stress, triggering um, increases in heart rate, blood pressure, stress hormones, or inflammatory factors. And if sustained over time, um, this can lead to wear and tear on the body. I want to just highlight one example of one of these pathways. So there's some um, interesting work done by Steve Cole that has illustrated how loneliness is linked to a state of threat, um, signaling a sympathetic response, including the release of norepinephrine in bone marrow, uh, priming an inflammatory response. Uh, chronic levels of inflammation have been linked to mental, cognitive, and physical health outcomes. Um, and these chronic illnesses, in turn, increase one's risk for earlier death. So uh, chronic inflammation may be one common pathway explaining diverse outcomes associated with social connection. But I do want to highlight it's just one of many pathways that have been identified in in the literature. But I think it's it's nice to illustrate, um, especially um, for for the um, those that might seem like there are such varied kinds of outcomes um, that there may be potential common pathways. Um, but we also know that there are um, behavioral ways in which this might occur as well. So we we have um, there's large bodies of evidence um, and and uh, research looking at, for instance, the impact of social norms and pressures and and how um, individuals behave both in positive and negative ways that can ultimately influence health. Um, as well as um, access to resources and information. Um, there are also um, studies that document the importance of social connection in times of crises. So whether it's losing a job, a, national, uh, a natural disaster um, or hazard, uh, such as flooding, fires, and earthquakes, a heat wave, pandemic, war, you name it, um, uh, social connection can influence our ability to mobilize resources. Um, and oftentimes that can be a matter of survival. And as many of these crises become more frequent and more um, likely, um, this is another important way in which social connection may be um, quite important um, to, um, to, to society and, and um, not only health outcomes, but survival outcome. Uh, so one of the questions that often comes up is, you know, while there is compelling evidence of association with health um, and mortality, is it causal? Um, establishing causality can be quite challenging, uh, particularly for factors that are not easily manipulated. And um, few epidemiological studies are experimental. 
Um, nonetheless, other public health issues um, have faced similar challenges. Um, and, uh, and so, for instance, um, uh, uh, the Bradford Hill criteria was used to address these challenges in establishing um, smoking as um, a causal factor for cancer. Um, and so uh, um, the nine criteria that are included in or, or guidelines um, lay particular emphasis on the temporality of the relationship, the strength of the relationship, the presence of a plausible dose response relationship, uh, the consistency of the findings in um, a, across diverse studies and coherence with other disciplinary findings and, and biomedical theory. Um, so Hoek and colleagues evaluated the evidence for social connection against these same criteria. Um, and then in this table I created, um, I note some of the supporting evidence here um, that goes along with these um, Radford Hill criteria. Um, and one thing to note is that um, the only factor that um, it doesn't um, meet is specificity um, because it impacts more than one outcome. Um, but most notably, smoking doesn't meet that criteria either. <laughs> um, um, but, but using the Bradford Hill criteria, they concluded that the evidence supports the causal link between strong social connections and, and better health and longer life. But I do want to note that there are many critics of the Bradford Hill um, guidelines and um, recommendations for other approaches, um, including the data integration framework and newer methods. So, um, the data integration framework incorporates data from multiple scientific scientific di disciplines, not just um, epidemiology. Um, and this approach also further supports um, the likelihood of causality. Um, but also some of these newer methods um, um, are starting to be used, but of course there are, are um, fewer studies. So um, for example, a few studies have started to use um, propensity matching, uh, causal mediation um, analyses and Mendelian randomization. And the results are consistent with a causal role. Um, so these newer methods also support the potential causality of, of social connection on health. Um, but as, as with all things, um, you know, more evidence um, is uh, um, better <laughs> and, and needed. Um, so I wanted to just briefly um, highlight where we have strengths in the evidence, where our challenges lie, and where we need to go from here in, in, in terms of our priorities. So in terms of the strength of the evidence, we have converging evidence across multiple scientific disciplines. The challenge, though, is that there's variability in conceptualization and measurement um, that because they originate from different disciplines. So one um, uh, direction that is needed in terms of prioritization is a multifactorial assessment approach um, that encompasses across these. Um, another strength is that we have many validated assessment tools, um, but the challenge is that because there's variability in these tools, it limits comparisons across time and different samples. Um, and so we should prioritize the standardization of national assessments to establish uh, prevalence rates and to track national trends. Another strength is that we have evidence of a dose response of social connection across the lifespan. Um, however, one challenge is that much of the attention has um, been focused on those on extreme risk and often um, on older adults. And so we really need to um, prioritize our focus across the risk trajectory, including prevention and across ages. Uh, we also have strong ev um, converging evidence across those different components of social connection. So what I mean by that is the structure, function, and quality elements that I, I um, uh, presented earlier. Um, 
However, uh, one of the challenges that few studies examine them in the same sample. Um, most uh, studies often look at one component or one indicator. Uh, and so another priority is to further the evidence of potential independent additive and synergistic effects so that we can more precisely assess risk. Another strength is um, that we have strong evidence in terms of mortality across causes of death, country of origin, gender, and health status. However, there are fewer studies on some diseases, so much of it is on cardiovascular disease, with less on other diseases. And most of that evidence comes from um, uh, wealthier nations. And so we need more evidence from low and middle income countries, um, as well as underrepresented groups. And so we do need to prioritize research to fill some of these gaps. Um, we also have uh, robust evidence um, in terms of objective health outcomes. Um, but we have um, weaker and mixed evidence in terms of the effects um, of, of strategies used to actually mitigate these risks. And so we do need to prioritize evidence-based approaches and rigorous evaluations in terms of interventions to reduce risk. And then finally, we have um, uh, robust evidence of, of mortality and health risks, but we know less about other kinds of outcomes that are non-health related. So we need to prioritize um, uh, research on more diverse outcomes, including economic outcomes, civic engagement, education outcomes, um, incarceration, violence, et cetera, as these may impact all of these. So one of the things that I, I, I pointed to is that the, the large need for, we know a lot about how this can impact um, health, but what do we do about it, right? And um, unfortunately, according to the National Institute of Health, uh, developing effective treatments takes a really long time. <laughs> and this is because 95% of the time they fail. Um, and yet we've seen social interventions being um, launched and scaled without adequate evidence of their effectiveness. Um, so particularly during the pandemic, we saw a great need of need and desire to want to help people. We want solutions, we need solutions, and we need them now. Um, so how do we do this in a responsible way to accelerate, accelerate this process in a very strategic way? So um, I want to um, share with you uh, a a, a, an idea that we have. Um, so drawing upon evidence um, suggesting a dose response effect, um, it suggests that we are all somewhere on this continuum. Um, and uh, unfortunately though, most of our current approaches um, are focused on the individual level, targeting those on the extreme end of the spectrum. So in other words, even if we have successful interventions, we are only reaching a small portion of the population. We also need to find societal level approaches. And so by um, potentially protecting uh, or focusing on protective effects of social connection, um, instead of just affecting extreme ends of the spectrum, we may be able to potentially shift population level risks. So um, one of the ways that um, my colleagues and I have um, proposed to, to do this is um, uh, uh, we've proposed a framework um, called the social framework that aims to facilitate and accelerate progress um, uh, towards a, a society that values social connectedness across the lifespan and across all societal domains. And to illustrate untapped opportunities to significantly influence population health, many of which are not adequately addressed um, in national public health discourse um, today. So we wanted to draw upon 
um, and merge existing uh, models, including the socio-ecological model and the health and all policies model. So we started um, with this idea of, of the socio-ecological model that I think many of, of you are, are familiar with that has, um, uh, in essence, acknowledges the person, but that they're embedded within um, interpersonal relationships, within their community, organizations, or institutions, and society. And so by taking this model and then integrating it with the World Health Organization's health and all policy model, we recognize that there is relevance to every sector of society. So I wanna note um, one, one potential um, uh, silver lining of, of the pandemic was that we recognized the social relevance of all of these sectors. And so what I mean by that is as we, as a population had to limit our social contact, we saw how it affected every single sector of society. We saw how it impacted employment, education, um, entertainment. Um, it, it affected all aspects of life. And what that suggests is that all these sectors of society potentially play a role. Um, and so we need to be thinking about how um, uh, to, to strategically look at these um, um, from that lens across these levels of the socio-ecological model. So we acknowledge all of um, and overlay these within this, this social model. And I forgot to mention, and I'll, I'll point out in, in, you know, in the corner here, the social model um, is an acronym for systemic framework of cross-sector integration across um, and action across the lifespan. Um, so as we overlay these two existing models, we also acknowledge some cross-cutting themes that we need to pay attention to. Oh, and, um, and that these um, uh, sectors can um, collaborate with each other. Um, so these cross-cutting um, factors include um, recognition of modality. So um, recognizing that um, in-person contact and remote contact may differ in meaningful ways, and we need to consider that as we consider our approaches. Um, recognizing that um, social connection is important across the lifespan, and so our approaches need to um, uh, similarly um, acknowledge this and um, be targeted in, in some way. The next cross-cutting theme is um, uh, inclusion, diversity, and equity and access, and recognizing that oftentimes um, that access um, is not equal across um, all, all groups, and that um, if there's in unequal access to uh, various resources, um, including things like access to parks um, where people can gather, um, that these kinds of things can um, uh, lead to inequity um, in other kinds of outcomes. And then um, uh, the last uh, cross-cutting theme is the recognition of the need for research and evidence across these. So as we um, consider whether this is um, uh, approaches, um, interventions, policies, that these should be evidence-based and informed. So if we look back to this model, you can see it's kind of complicated. <laughs> There's a lot to it, right? Um, and so um, I, we try to put this in terms of, um, in a way, a, a, a grid. So the, um, Let's see if I get the green columns here represent the levels of the socio-ecological model. And the these um, uh, blue uh, rows rec represent these sectors across the health and all policy model. And where these intersect, um, we've just numbered these as a way that we can systematically identify opportunities to both intervene as well as um, evaluate the evidence. 
Um, and, and then, of course, um, just giving an example of the lifespan here, but of course, all of those cross-cutting themes. Um, and so what, it's, what is hoped is that this framework can allow governments, institutions, and others to, to identify, test, and evaluate um, uh, um, various uh, solutions to accelerate progress in this area. What I want to point out, though, is that um, much of the evidence uh, falls primarily within one of these cells. And that's um, not to say that there isn't evidence across um, any of these others. There is. Um, but the bulk of the evidence um, is at the individual level within the health sector. Um, and so what this suggests is that um, there's perhaps you know, 95% of untapped opportunity to potentially affect change. And so by systematically doing this, we may be able to accelerate this process. Um, so um, the, the foundation um, for social connection that I'm um, the scientific chair for, we're in um, the process of writing various sector reports that have taken sector by sector um, and identifying ways that we can go beyond um, just the individual level and look at broader approaches. Um, there is now a, a health sector report, uh, um, education report, and an employment report, and um, with others uh, to come. Um, but uh, we, we hope that this will uh, help guide some of these other sectors to see both their relevance um, and approaches to, to uh, tackle this. So I just want to um, uh, conclude by um, you know, acknowledging and coming full circle um, that while the pandemic certainly um, brought a level of attention and urgency to addressing this issue, it isn't new. Um, and so we do need to approach it very carefully um, and um, ensure that our, our approaches are, are um, evidence-based so that we can um, make sure that we are not um, uh, tackling this in a way that uh, might not be the best use of, of time and resources. Um, because my big concern is that if we um, well-meaning in, in intention, um, if we put a lot of money and resources into things that um, aren't effective, that those um, resources will be placed elsewhere and that this issue will continue to exist and as we've seen from the evidence, this issue does have serious consequences. Um, so we do need to be um, very careful about how we approach it. Um, and uh, uh, with that, I just want to thank you all um, for your attention. And um, I uh, welcome any and all questions. And I'll go ahead and stop sharing so I can see your faces. <laughs> Thank you, Julianne, for that wonderful uh, summary of your work and thoughts about future directions in this area. Um, I know there are a couple of questions in the chat, but if I if I could um, maybe ask a, a quick question as as host, um, and you you sort of touched on this in your um, uh, concluding remarks, but um, you know it seems to me that one of the things that have come out of the pandemic is the sort of observation that, you know, people are spending more time interacting with one another remotely. Um, I know this is, you know, not necessarily uh, the case for everyone, but, you know, I know for me, it, it seems like, you know, the days are sometimes filled with, uh, you know, work Zoom, followed by family Zoom, followed by <laughs> friend Zoom. And, um, uh, and I'm really curious to hear your thoughts about how how much social experience we um, as social scientists are, are missing by you know, relying on measures of social connection that you know, predated social media. Um, and do you, do you think these kinds of measures such as you know, time spent interacting with family and friends online 
uh, should be included in, in, in standard indices of, of social connection. Yeah, I think it's a, a really important question that we absolutely need better evidence on. And I think you, you know, really struck the nail on the head um, by recognizing that our standard measurement approaches do not adequately capture this. Um, so most of the standardized measurements, um, validated measures that are used in research were um, developed long before um, the use of many of these technologies. Um, and we can't just assume that they are equivalent. Um, there may be ways in which they may be better or worse <laughs> or equivalent. Um, and, and so, but, but we can't just assume that they're the same. Um, and we do need um, better measurement of that. It's really interesting because I've um, started to see um, some more novel kinds of approaches um, through um, not even um, self-report data, but looking at things like um, big data and even um, AI approaches um, to try and identify um, how how uh, socially connected people are or um, how lonely they may feel. Um, there are, um, so, you know, there is the possibility of, of um, it, either modifying our existing kind and testing um, our existing self-report measures, but also looking beyond self-report measures. Um, I, I think it's also really, um, uh, interesting um, that much of, so for instance, the epidemiological research that I um, presented on, on mortality, many of these studies followed people, as you recall, um, in one case, it was an average of seven years, the other, it was seven and a half years. But um, these, these epidemiological studies uh, typically follow people for years, often decades, and it averaged out to, to seven or so years. Um, so in many cases, these um, predated uh, the widespread use of, of these tech, um, uh, you know, whether it's social media, but other kinds of, I mean, the widespread use of Zoom has changed drastically just since the pandemic. Hardly anyone used it um, before, um, and now almost everyone uses it, right? And that's, and, and that's a different kind of technology than, say, um, you know, what we traditionally think of as social media. Um, and so the fact that these um, many, much of this data um, doesn't necessarily um, account for that, although we do have newer epidemiological studies that would encompass and, and capture some of those years. Um, I don't know that we have a good sense of what the long-term effects are of, of the use of these tools. Um, and so while we're learning a lot about um, some of the shorter term and correlational evidence, um, we also need to recognize that these technologies are constantly evolving, and particularly when it comes to um, uh, social media platforms, because their algorithms are constantly changing. And so, you know, what exactly are we studying? Because by the time you study something and publish it, the you know, it's already changed. <laughs> um, the algorithms are, are constantly changing. Um, so um, it, it poses a, a real challenge, and that's um, certainly something that, as I mentioned, the National Academies um, uh, Committee is, is going to also um, be considering um, recommendations around how to, um, how, what kinds of research is needed in this area to adequately address some of these questions, because um, there's no doubt that the way in which we are interacting socially has changed um, because of technology. And we don't, I think, fully understand the full ramifications of that. Great. Thank you.
Um, I know there's some questions in the chat, and um, you know we're a small group here, so if folks are comfortable, I will invite folks to simply raise your hand um, if that's okay, and I'll call on you. Um, otherwise, I'm happy to read questions. Um, uh, Matthew, um, do you want to ask your question, or would you prefer that I, I do? Uh, Matthew, are you still with us? Um, okay. Well, uh, I, I will I will read Matthew's question. Um, so he uh, he has a number of questions. Um, uh, one of the questions, I guess, is to do with um, your thoughts on kind of the relative contributions of these different forms of social connections that you've outlined. So the functional, the um, uh, you know quality uh, and structural, and you know whether you see differences in, for example, um, having lack of relationships with folks versus having bad relationships in terms of their effects on health. Yeah, so I'm, I, I'm looking at the chat now, so I'll try and um, maybe tackle them in order. So the first one is, um, you know, do people who like to be alone, um, are they affected differently by social isolation? Um, so uh, it's, First of all, it's somewhat of a complicated question because um, I, I will acknowledge that many of the studies have looked at isolation and loneliness separately. Um, so we have a lot of st studies on social isolation and a lot of studies on, on loneliness, but fewer where we look at whether or not people are both isolated and lonely or one or the other. Um, so with that, that caveat, what I can say is that um, the, the evidence shows that they are both significant um, predictors of risk for um, premature mortality. And as um, you mentioned, um, Andrew Steptoe is coming in um, a couple of weeks to, to present to you. And in fact, um, his is one of the large studies that showed um, that uh, um, adjusting for loneliness isolation still significantly predicted premature mortality, but when you adjust for loneliness, sorry, when you adjust for isolation, loneliness um, is no longer a significant predictor. Um, you could take that as um, a couple of different ways um, interpret that. Um, uh, it could be interpreted as um, isolation being um, having a more robust independent effect on mortality than loneliness um, or it could be um, interpreted as um, that isolation is a mediating factor um, um, impacting um, its effect um, and so uh, but but back to that you know kind of the question i think um, one of the the key issues that i often hear is um, that in some cases um, people want to know, um, and a related is, you know, what about introverts who who might like to be alone and like spending time alone, um, and um, and while uh, maybe introverts and extro extroverts may have different preferences in how they socially connect, we don't have evidence that introverts don't need social connection, um, and in fact. Um, there, there is um, some evidence to suggest that um, uh, introverts may be um, at higher risk for loneliness um, than, than extroverts. Um, uh, and uh, I, I'm reminded of a colleague, um, uh, Rich Satcher, who did some research during the pandemic um, that I thought was just so clever because <clears throat> I, I'm sure you all saw, you know, all the memes of, you know, introverts have been training for this our whole lives. <laughs> um, let's reach out to our, our our extroverted friends who are who are, you know, suffering during this time. Um, but yet, uh, his research suggested um, actually it was introverts that suffered most. Um, and so, uh, I think that we um, shouldn't just assume that. Um, that uh, because someone may be introverted that they, they don't need social connection and um, of course um, may, um, may need our, our support and, and as well. Um, but the, the other, um, I think, uh, related factor is, and it's 
I think part two here is, you know, can social isolation be beneficial? And, you know, related to both isolation and loneliness, in the short term, um, they may be adaptive. Um, so for instance, um, uh, that biological motive of loneliness, um, you know, helps motivate us to, to reconnect socially. So that, that's thought to be adaptive. Um, and time spent alone, um, solitude may have um, some adaptive effects um, in the short term. Um, however, um, uh, if these are left um, and, and our social needs are not met um, uh, over time, um, the evidence suggests that there are um, severe and significant long-term effects. Um, and so having a moment to yourself now and then um, and feeling the occasional um, pang of loneliness now and then um, is um, uh, not going to be as detrimental as someone who experiences it on a chronic basis. Um, uh, and, and we do have good evidence of the long-term effects of, and detrimental effects of both of those. Um, and then the third um, is, um, um, are, are no relationships better than bad relationships? <laughs> um, so, you know, unfortunately, we can't randomly assign people to be isolated or <laughs> in bad relationships. Um, um, but interestingly, um, we have looked at things like um, to what extent um, other relationships might buffer the effects of, of negative relationships or even um, aspects of isolation. So um, uh, there was a, a recent study, and I'm trying to remember who did it, it wasn't me, sorry, um, that looked at to what extent um, uh, social networks outside the home um, and in companionship outside the home uh, buffered the effects of living alone. Um, and what they found was that um, it, although it, it partially um, compensated, it didn't fully compensate and that's similar to some of the research that um, I did earlier, looking at biological, um, uh, like blood pressure responses and stress responses um, that showed that um, uh, other supportive relationships in one's network didn't fully buffer the effects of um, uh, some of the um, more negative relationships. And so, um, uh, while we want to um, strive for having more positive kinds of relationships in, in our social networks, um, um, hopefully uh, um, we, we can have um, a, a variety of types of relationships so that um, uh, we aren't relying on any one particular relationship um, to meet all of our social needs. Um, and um, we have very robust evidence that complete lack of relationships is, is detrimental. Um, <laughs> um, but uh, uh, so it, it also comes down to, you know, it's, it's similar to, I, I've often gotten people say or, or make the comment, so if, um, if I have lots of friends, then can I still smoke? <laughs> <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, we need to acknowledge that, um, you know, that um, both can impact our risk <laughs> for mortality. And so both lacking um, social connection and having bad relationships can put us at increased risk um, and smoking can put us at increased risk. Um, so we, we want to um, try to as much um, limit some of these uh, riskier factors and um, uh, hopefully uh, foster more of the resilience and, and protective factors in our lives. Thank you for that. Um, James, I know you have a number of questions. Do you um, want to ask? Um, uh... Sure. Thank you. I, uh, this is fascinating. Um, uh, first of all, Lundstedt, thank you so much for, for all this and your time. Uh, and I, um, I'm really curious about your responses here to, to Matthew's question. So um, one, I have 
kind of two big questions and you can answer either one or, or neither one say abstain yeah um but one is control over social connections it seems like that's important almost maybe more than the amount you know like uh i live in a small house with I have three kids and pets and my wife and i are like you know sometimes it's like i just i just need a moment um and the, the ability to have that moment is a big is big and then it allows all the other richness of social interaction to feel good um so i'm curious about if you if you have thought about, about that um and the other big question is kind of uh what about ways to like the social mechanisms that lead to loneliness so it, it seems like you have an incredible body of work that you've um contributed to and assembled here that suggests how the social isolation can affect health but what uh, what causes social isolation i guess that's a whole other <laughs> huge topic yeah. i'm just curious your thoughts yeah. about either one of those big things. um so interestingly um the I'm sure I don't know if you're familiar, but um, when you mentioned the perhaps control or some kind of balance in your life, um, I was reminded of a question that was included in I believe it was one of the Cigna surveys on on loneliness, and and if you're not familiar, Cigna or Cigna did a uh, a, a large national study on on loneliness. I did a couple of them, um, and I think it was in the Cigna one. It could have been in a different one, um, but in essence, it, it was one of these large um, studies um, that didn't necessarily come out of academia, <laughs> um, but was nonetheless, um, you know, large um, uh, nationally representative data. Um, and they in, uh, utilized a, a um, you know, one of these um, uh, research um, sources. I, I can't remember if it was Ipsos or, or one of the, or, or Gallup or who it was, but. Um, big survey. Yeah, big survey company. <laughs> um, but what was interesting is they asked um, a question around something about almost this Goldilocks effect, right? Of, you know, too much or too little <laughs> um, and that just right. Um, and interestingly, uh, at the, they found that either too much or too little was associated with worse kinds of outcomes. Um, and so I think that might begin, you know, it may not completely answer your question, but I think it might start to get at um, uh, this idea of, um, uh, of you know, kind of what are the bounds or limits on this, right? And and while I, I, I didn't go into detail, there is some really amazing um, evidence uh, um, from uh, a group out of UNC that took four nationally representative data sets and, and identified dose response effects of, of social connection across all three elements, across ages. But it's also drawing on questions that have bounds, right? And I think this comes up a lot in terms of, you know, okay, um, we know that uh, on the extreme low end, that's bad, and there seems to be this um, uh, gradient effect. But is there an upper limit? Like, are there points where it's too much? <laughs> um, and 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 what is you know what does that look like? Um, and I don't think we have a very good understanding of it. But at least that question, and your um, not only your description but others that I've heard have have described um, a need for. Um, um, a, a way to to um, manage that in a way that doesn't um, exceed one's you know resources or ca capacity, um, but I'm also really cautious because I am seeing a trend that I have not seen previously. Um, that really almost in a way glorifies time spent alone um and 
I'm not saying like we should never ha- spend any time alone, but it almost feels as though, you know, how oftentimes there are, you know, pendulum swings um, where perhaps we put so much emphasis on perhaps, um, uh, you know, having wide social networks or uh, especially, you know, with with social media and it's all about, you know, how many followers and likes you have um, that there may be this kind of pendulum swing to to um, uh, kind of evaluating alone time, quiet time. Um, and but also um, a sense i'm I'm hearing around um, also not wanting to do anything that makes us uncomfortable. And that I think a lot of what we've experienced over the past couple of years of being able to kind of be in our comfortable home, you know, with our sweats or jammies or <laughs> whatever, you know, that it, sometimes, um, you know, it, it takes a little work to get yourself ready and out the door or wear shoes or, <laughs> um, or energy to, to interact with others. And um, that, that um, perhaps there's a tendency to not want to push ourselves into um, environments that um, may make us somewhat uncomfortable. Um, and, I, you know, I'm just, trying to be thoughtful here about what the potential implications are because I'm more comfortable working from home. I I'm, you know, and, but are we also creating environments that enable us to increasingly spend more time in isolation and more and more kind of chronic environments of isolation? Um, And, and so I'm just trying to be thoughtful about balancing all of these, um, kinds of trends and what they might mean in the future. Um, and I don't have all the answers, but, but trying to be thoughtful. Thank you, uh, Julian. I, um, if I may, I know we're, we're at almost at time, but if I could just <laughs> as host ask the last question, I, I'm not going to ask you to weigh in on the discussion on screen time and, and loneliness, but, but I'm, I'm, I am curious about um, how socially isolated individuals and lonely individuals, how they use social media. Um, I don't know if you are aware of data on this, but I remember, you know, um, I think it was John Cassiopo in a talk once um, sort of uh, mentioned this, and I didn't know if he was referring to any data per se, but the, the, the intuition was that um, it's not the amount of time spent on social media that differentiates lonely from non-lonely people, it's how they use social media. And the idea was that, you know, lonely people, um, so, sorry, non-lonely people use social media as a way of reducing physical distance, right? They make plans to actually see people offline, whereas people who are um, more lonely use social media to reduce that physical sort of social connection. They 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 use it to remain online. And I I was just curious whether you knew of any data that supported this sort of uh, uh, claim or, or or not. Well, not that specific claim, but I do know from talking to lots of people who who this you know looking at social media like that is their entire focus. Um, I do know that many of them have said that they are moving away from looking at just amount of time people are spending on social media to looking at how they're using social media. Um, But the interesting thing is, um, and I'm not revealing anything privileged here because it's in the recordings that you can watch on the National Academy's um, website, is um, presentations about how, in essence, um, much of these companies um, and social media is um, is uh, an economy of attention. That's how they make their money, is how much time and attention we spend on it. 
Um, and so um, in a way, I don't think we can or should completely discount time entirely. Um, so yes, I, I think that how, how things are used can um, certainly impact various outcomes. Um, and we do need to acknowledge that there are um, important benefits, particularly for people who um, are seeking support um, where they cannot get support um, in, you know, in their geographically located, where they're geographically located. Um, and so there is um, some really helpful points, but, um, but uh, these tools are designed to, to occupy our attention. Um, and so um, we can't really discount how that is um, potentially displacing our attention from other things, including um, our relationships. Um, so I know we're we're at time, but it's really complicated. And um, I, I do encourage you, that, um, as I mentioned, those recordings are on the website. So if you're interested, you can always um, watch some of them. <laughs> yeah. No, thank you. I was just going to say, maybe we should just get offline right now and go out and talk to somebody <laughs> in person. <laughs> but on, on, on that note, I want to thank um, Julianne for uh, joining us today and sharing her wonderful research. I learned a lot. And um, um, have a wonderful day, everyone. Hope you were actually able to connect with people. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs>